a bit of a centre assistant down at uh, the Radipole Lake uh, Visitor Centre here in Maine. Radipole um, was uh, effectively sort of uh, colonised um, way, way back um, by the Celtic, Celtic people. Um, and um, they probably would have used the area as a, as a resource for fishing, that sort of thing. It's not really, I suppose, until the, uh, the Romans arrived um, in this country that uh, any sort of serious infrastructure was put in place. The Romans would have been able to navigate up through the riverway in those days because the river would have been much wider and would have extended much further, um, probably right the way over to Greenhill in those days. Um, so it's thought that the Romans were probably able to get able to get the galleons up the river as far as the settlement we now know as Radipole Village. Um, there is some speculation that um, a, a small port may have been put in place by the Romans at Radipole Village. Um, there's no hard evidence really to suggest that. There's also conjecture that um, a road would possibly have gone from Radipole Village um, over to um, the, the, the base of uh, uh, the Ridgeway Hill and then gone up and over the Ridgeway um, and uh, would have gone past uh, Maiden Castle, which of course would have been in those days uh, the main sort of uh, Celtic settlement in this area. I suppose the next big historical event really in the Riverway and Weymouth Harbour's history would have been the arrival of the Black Death in the 1300s the first arrival of the plague in this country and it's it's quite well known historically that Weymouth was the entry point for that. As the population of Weymouth expanded and there was a need for more and more housing um, and um, the port expanded, more and more of the lake was reclaimed um, and um, so you know you have the building of a commercial road for example which by dignity in its name commercial road was set up from a, for commercial purposes. The next major sort of event really I suppose in, in Weymouth's history um, is the Second World War. Um, obviously Portland was a huge, um, in those days, um, naval port um, and uh, a very significant part of um, Britain's defences um, which would have got heavily bombed, which was heavily bombed in fact. We get to the situation where places like Swannery Car Park are um, built. The, the car park itself are pretty much made up really of bomb damage um, and um, also the main path network through Radipole Lake Nature Reserve here is also made up of bomb damage from the Second World War. Back before um, Western Bridge it was, itself was built, um, which um, was built in the 1920s and effectively um, started to form Radipole Lake, um, the area was known as the backwater. Ships would have been able to come up through here, um, but old maps from the 1800s show us that there was an island of land in the middle of that backwater, um, which is probably what forms the basis of the Radipole Nature Reserve now. Um, the area of land that the public are admitted to and that they can walk around is the, still the same island that was here during the days when the area was known as the backwater. The RSPB um, had been interested in the place, um, really from sort of like the 1970s. Um, you know, various local bird watchers and wildlife enthusiasts had sort of been mentioning to them for several years, you know, you really should take another look at Radipole Lake. It would be a good, uh, it would be a good place for you to set up. And so that's indeed what happened. The Visitor Self Centre was built in the early 80s. Um, and uh, as I say, we've been here ever since. A lot of people come to the main Swannery car park to park up and go to the beach. But a lot of those people also discover us quite by accident, some of them. With regard to what species we get here, well, um, there's quite a wide um, list of species, really. Um, we're here in um, late November, um, which is actually one of the better times to come. Uh, Weymouth is, is um, uh, quite a good spot for overwintering birds. Um, and those include things like bittern, which is um, up until the, uh, the 90s um, was an, uh, a very, very rare bird in this country. Um, we have another big enigmatic bird that we've got here that actually does um, breed on Weymouth, 
reserves is uh, the Marsh Harrier, which is uh, the apex predator um, that's um, very easy to see. In fact, this is probably one of the best sites in the country to see Marsh Harriers. Um, right here in the middle of Weymouth, um, and they've been nesting here for about four years. Although the last few years the reserve's gone through sort of a massive renovation in terms of its wildlife, so we've done a lot of work uh, funded by Natural England uh, to enhance the reed beds and the, uh, for the wildlife. So that's kind of all come to an end and we're seeing the benefits from that. There's, there's a real increase in sort of all the species which we're trying to uh, improve the reserve for. Um, so now all that's done, we wanted to do something uh, to make the reserve really accessible to people so they can come down and, and find out all about this wildlife that's in the middle of Weymouth. So yeah, the, the Nature Reserve itself has had um, Quite a lot of improvements with uh, new decking areas, new boardwalk facilities, and viewing areas. Uh, the biggest problem with reed beds is that they grow pretty tall. They can grow sort of about eight foot tall in the space of a few months, so it, it, it doesn't allow people to see into them, and it's quite a thick sort of thick vegetation. So what we've done is built these high viewing areas so people can get up above the reeds, look out over the reserve, and, and, and sort of see all the wildlife a lot easier. Um, We've also put a, new, a few boardwalks out into the reeds themselves so that people can get that sort of, uh, sort of feeling of being in, the, in amongst all the reed beds, doing the same as the birds and the, all, the, all sorts of insects and things that you find in there. Um, and also in the autumn there's a few new things going in as well, a few extra raised areas, just to allow people to get that better view. And ultimately as well, it's not been done there so far, but uh, we'll have a brand new hide hopefully in the next few years, which will be a massive improvement. Um, it's a really popular place for people to go up and watch the, uh, watch the wildlife from. So that's kind of the furthest point on the reserve you can get to. And uh, yeah, you get some really fantastic views from there. So we're getting even better than now. Yeah, we've come down to Radapole today to uh, let Lytton do his nature a bit and feed the ducks and the pigeons and do some artwork in the, uh, the home of uh, RSPB down here. And then we're off to uh, go ahead and try and get some robins to feed my hands, which James loves doing. Each season brings its different colours. At the moment, it's all sort of russet colours and reds, and but in the spring, it's all greens, and it's lovely. And all the different birds, it's really exciting to walk around. We see different things every day. Well, the, the important thing with the nature reserve is it's for wildlife. Uh, that's why it's here, and that's why we manage it. And the RSPB has been involved here for over 30 years. Um, in, in enhancing it for wildlife. Um, but nowadays we're a charity um, run by its members and of course if, if we didn't have members we wouldn't be able to do any, anything here and across the country. This is one of uh, 220 odd reserves. So um, the impact on the wildlife is, is minimal. Everything we do here is, is thought very carefully through and uh, if we do any building works and things it's all done at the right time of year and, and in places where it's not going to impact the wildlife. Um, but at the same time then it improves it massively for people. So it's about trying to get that balance of sort of viewing and, and the wildlife as well um, to ultimately, you know, people come along, have a really nice time, see all the, all the fantastic wildlife that's um, on view. They, they may just uh, come in and, and give us a bit of extra support as well through perhaps joining or coming along on the events or just buying a cup of coffee or something. It's very um, refreshing to walk across here in the mornings, especially this time of year, but it's just, uh, you know, every day is different, walking across with all the birds and wildlife. It's great. It's a nice place to walk the dog. My daughter's in a wheelchair, we can get round in the wheelchair. So it's a, a lovely place to, to have. The wildlife, I mentioned earlier on that it's a reed bed, and with reed beds there's a lot of species that purely depend on them. Uh, years ago, reed bed covered quite a large area of the country, uh, but during so World War II, lots of it was drained and turned into farmland. So as a result, all the species which you find in reed beds became very rare. So uh, our main priorities here are things like the reed warblers and sed warblers, little brown birds which come in from Africa. Um, you know, they're not much to look at, but they, they, their lives are amazing. They travel 5,000 odd miles every year just to come here and breed, and that's because of the reeds. And then you, with the reed warblers, you get the cuckoo. So everybody knows about the cuckoo, how they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. So we've got cuckoos back here now, which we didn't have a few years ago. 
So that's as a result of all the improvements. And ultimately, if you get a lo lots and lots of little birds, and of course there's lots of mammals and reptiles and things that live in the reed beds as well, grass snakes and different types of water voles and water shrews and things like that. Uh, you're going to get the predators as well. So one very special bird here is the marsh harrier, which is really easy to see. It's a massive bird of prey, hunts over the reeds, sort of flying around all the time. And conveniently, it nests up by the north height, right in front of it. So you can go up there and uh, and just watch that. And uh, they bred in Dorset for the first time over 50 years, four years ago, in 2009. And uh, they they kind of do they're doing really well. We've now got two pairs in Weymouth, and um, this is still the only place in Dorset where they breed. And it's only. Well, in the whole southwest, uh, there's only three sites where marsh harriers breed, and Wayne is one of them, so it's a very rare bird, so um, a real spectacle for people to see. And, uh, yeah, still, a lot of people don't know it's uh, they're on show here, so again, with the visitor centre now being quite different, hopefully get more people in to, to discover and see all this uh, amazing wildlife. Well, on top of all the works uh, which we've done, sort of all the construction things, all the new viewing areas and the, and the refurb in the visitor centre, we, we can now also offer a lot of other activities for people as well. So we've built a duck feeding platform which people can come and enjoy because feeding the ducks is fantastic, isn't it? That's usually for people's first first sort of experience of birds, you know, coming along as a kid, feeding the ducks. So we're really enhancing that. And also just behind us, we've got some pond dipping which the kids can come along and uh, sort of net around in the water, finding all the little mini beasts which are pretty important for the wildlife because they're ultimately they get eaten by all the other birds and things. And uh, we're going to have a whole range of events as well um, on top of what we used to do. We've always done guided walks with things, but we want to do a lot more and um, yeah, make this place as accessible as possible and uh, enjoyable.